welcome, Richard. Uh, welcome to the Basis Project. Uh, one of my one of my researchers um, passed me your link to uh, a lecture you did on January the twenty seventh, and um, well, bloody hell, uh, <laughs> it's a very very serious. We've just been looking at it here on a DVD. I've made it into a DVD so we can watch it without the interference with possibly it not being there next time you want to look. Um, what the basis project, or what I've been doing, is I like to get down to the detail and as technical as possible, so that as much is recorded in the actual interview or presentation as is technically available at the time. And if somebody can't um, understand it, they can always look at it later or look, uh, look it up at some other time. So you have got a presentation for us, and um, could you describe really why should we pay any attention? to what you're saying, because what you're saying is very important. What right do you have to say it, and, and how do you know it's right or wrong or anything like that? I mean, why would we pay any attention to somebody like you? <laughs> fair, fair question. I sometimes uh, feel that way myself when I'm getting up presenting at places. Um, in fairness, uh, people should know that way back in 1976, I was selected to be uh, with the American Heart Association, and I became the youngest faculty member at that point in time. And with that came uh, a few responsibilities. One was to help work with and modify the basic cardiac life support uh, protocols and the advanced cardiac life support protocols. <clears throat> but it also included another area, which was something known as the physician cholesterol education faculty. And that faculty was when we started talking to people uh, the general public and physicians alike about what caused heart disease and what types of things needed to be done to address it. And in that era, it was very much um, cholesterol, cholesterol, cholesterol. And cholesterol does, in fact, play a role, but uh, it certainly is not the only thing. And it, it took me a couple, a few decades uh, to, uh, to work out some of the details on that in um, in fairness, it wasn't until about 1984, after I had uh, been presenting for several decades and teaching for several decades, and I'd already completed my fellowship in cardiology and looked at uh, errors that were being made in diagnostic imaging and was working on correcting that, that I went back and started looking at not only cardiology literature, but the other specialties in medicine, the other specialties in science, and then, of course, I needed to go beyond the United States. <clears throat> and that led me to about four to 500 papers uh, that I put together into what became known as the inflammation and cardiovascular disease theory or the Fleming cardiovascular disease theory or inflammation and heart disease. Depends upon who you talk to about it. It has different, different names. And in that, in that uh, theory... I explained that heart disease was or is an inflammothrombotic process. That is to say, it's a process that has inflammation or swelling, and it's a process that has associated blood clots. So it's an inflammothrombotic response. And at that point in time, I think, uh, I don't know if it's one of the slides in this presentation. Yes, it is. It's slide number 10. <clears throat> I actually uh, came out and explained that bacteria and viruses are part of the cause of that inflammation and, and blood clotting. And in fact, if you look at the Hamburg publications and you look at a number of other series of papers that are looking at SARS-CoV-2, um, you'll find out that the people are dying with inflammothrombotic disease, just as the theory presented in 1994. So that's one reason. Uh, the fact that the original theory that explains this was one that I presented in 94 uh, at American Heart. Uh, even though I was faculty, it wasn't viewed finally at the time. I presented it again in 95. It got published in a textbook in 99. From 2000 to 2003, I published a couple papers on the bacterial um, entities involved with this inflammatory process. So that was Helicobacter pylori and Streptococcus pneumoniae and Chlamydia pneumoniae. And then in 2004, I presented uh, on 2020 uh, the inflammation and heart disease process, and they were more interested in the dietary components, but certainly the other issues. And then during my cardiology fellowship years from 1890 to 92, I happened to be 
in the right place at the right time or at the wrong place at the wrong time, depending upon your perspective, where the new nuclear isotopes were, were coming out, uh, the technetium tracers. And uh, I wrote one of the first spec papers uh, and did some of the first PET work. Uh, in fact, I did uh, PET imaging on the Dean Ornish uh, patients. So I was intimately involved in both of those areas. And, you know, again, uh, very similar to the cholesterol stuff, the, the party line at that time was that you had to give two injections of these isotopes. Uh, to make them work, although we got uh, prettier pictures, but the problem is prettier pictures don't necessarily mean accurate pictures. So uh, my involvement in fellowship years from 89 to 92 looked at errors that were being made both with coronary angiography and with nuclear imaging and corrected those errors. And then I followed up with that when I got into private practice about 1999 and started um, trying to quantify those images. And in the quantification of those images, uh, one of the pharmaceutical companies came up to me and wanted to know if I would include breast cancer imaging in with my cardiac patients. And, you know, I, I, I looked at them somewhat strangely at the time because, you know, as a cardiologist, as a nuclear cardiologist, I don't think of myself as doing breast cancer imaging, although I'm, you know, I, I'm qualified to do it. And, and I told them I'd think about it. You know, they certainly presented some interesting uh, concerns about women and men not getting imaged. So I looked at it and uh, agreed to go ahead if I could uh, do it without increasing the radiation to anybody, uh, increasing any harm, and if they were people that also had heart disease that we we're worried about. And in doing that, I discovered uh, something that eventually came back to bite me. I discovered um, that the information from the pharmaceutical companies about how many injections of this isotope you needed uh, were wrong. And looking back on it, it was very clear, it's very clear to me that they intentionally uh, downplayed it um, because the competition was between two nuclear tracers, one that became called Sestamibia and one that was called Tevaroxime. I wrote the first spec paper on Tevaroxime and and the imaging sequence is such that Tevaroxime you had to image right away. And Sestamibi, the storyline from Big Pharma was, you know, you don't have to image right away. In fact, if you just wait an hour, that's fine. And that made it much more appealing for the people running the nuclear tests because scheduling was a problem. If they had to do things right away, that, that really was challenging for them. So the concept that Sesta maybe didn't really show up until an, half an hour to 45 minutes to an hour later uh, was very advantageous. And it basically took over the market with Tebaroxine just kind of going by the wayside. Well, it turns out that when that same company came to me to do the breast cancer imaging, the breast cancer imaging had to be done at about five minutes, uh, which is about the same time that we would have looked for heart disease with tebaroxime. Um, and in doing those images with breast cancer, we also got heart images. And we then comp I then compared those images um, later on with the, with the standard one hour images and discovered that they were different. They that the isotope really did move around or what's called redistribute. And what that meant was that instead of giving two doses of the isotope to get the comparison images, you only needed one dose. And so I, I went ahead and uh, started doing single injections uh, and doing the images sooner and later. So at five minutes and an hour for this isotope, it varies from different isotopes, but for this one. and. <clears throat> I ended up, frankly, going to federal court, uh, uh, being indicted for billing fraud because I dared to bill for two sets of images, even though I only gave one injection of the isotope. Now, it turns out that all the data, all the, all the evidence uh, showing that that was right uh, and defending me was blocked, not only by <laughs> the public defender, but by the judge. Um, so that never got presented and it caused a lot of confusion. But since then, um, you know, Yale University, Harvard University, Cedar sinai uh, University of Berlin, Johns Hopkins University, Emory, have all shown the same thing, that if you take these early images, uh, you find disease that is missed by the conventional approach. And what that did is it, it uh, 
it, it, once people recognize that, it changes how much of the isotope you have to buy from Big Pharma. And for Big Pharma, that amounted to $20 billion in lost profits. So they weren't happy. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's obviously a terrible thing to do a more accurate image with less radiation and to do it faster. Also in doing that, however, I discovered that the images themselves were were wrong uh, in so, in many instances because the prettier we tried to make the pictures, the smaller the pixel sizes uh, for resolution, the less information was being collected. And so the visual images were being based upon poor and poor image acquisition. Sorry, and how, how does I, that work? I mean, surely if you're dealing with better images and more resolution, you should get more no. information. No, I mean, the, so the problem is, is that there's uh, modulator transfer factor problems that occur um, as a result of having uh, finer and finer pixels. And when we did the analysis of it, um, it's very simple to do. I mean, the physics, uh, my original degree is, in, is a doctorate in physics. And uh, the physics of isotope decay doesn't change, even if humans want it to. So we discovered that by actually analyzing how well the cameras counted. And we discovered this modulation transfer function and a couple other factors, Fourier transfer, that interfered with the collection of the data. And it turns out that the... Um, the pixel sizes, if you set them correctly for any given camera, can actually accurately measure. And once we discovered that, then we started this measurement phenomenon. So does that does that mean that because of the native resolution of the camera, you, we are over over interpreting the the data to get the finer resolution, but you weren't getting a true resolution. Right. I mean, and, and and while it looked prettier, we were losing about thirty five to thirty four to thirty five percent of the of the radiation counts. And so the image, you know, and the, one of the problems that's always been present in nuclear almost since day one is that the more sophisticated the computer systems have become, uh, the more assumptions people have made with equipment and the poor quality wiring and just a variety of factors because you can always tweak it. And the problem is, is that when humans start tweaking things, they start making interpretive errors. And that's really, really what has happened. And so by going to this quantitative method, uh, I, I developed something called the Fleming method for tissue and vascular differentiation and metabolism, which now has been shortened to Fleming method. <laughs> Um, I thought FMTVDM was short enough, so just for your listeners, the patent is called the Fleming Method for Tissue and Vascular Differentiation Metabolism Using Same State Singular Sequential Quantification Comparisons. So I thought FMTVDM was short enough. But, oh, I don't know. know. I, I think that's a much better thing to just spell it out there. Yeah. But this is crucial in terms yeah. of false data, false imaging, based Absolutely. on over over yeah. analyzing the problem, so to speak. Yeah, it, it, and it, it's critical. And what it did is it provided it, so the patent got issued. Issued, uh, in 2017 um, after about two decades of work and it quantitatively measures and that's valuable because really what FM TVDM or Fleming method does is it measures regional changes in blood flow and tissue metabolism well we were using that primarily for heart disease and breast cancer and getting ready to apply it to other cancers and then along the scene uh, in 2019 comes something you know SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-2, we already knew, uh, based upon the breast cancer data, where the inflammatory, uh, inflammatory thrombotic readings were. And so, you know, when you're looking at SARS-CoV-2 and you're trying to assess it, there's really um, three different ways that you can do it. You can, you can get an antigen test. You can look to see if some protein is present, and that's what the PCR tests are. So, you know, the swabbing of the nasal pharynx or the oral pharynx, the nose or the throat, is looking for genetic material. Now, that's all it's doing. And so I, I, I frequently emphasize that PCR test is a really outstanding test for what it was designed for. The problem is it's being used for something it wasn't designed for. Um, it was designed to see if there's a genetic sequence of something present, not whether it's alive or what to do with it clinically or how severe the, the uh, disease might occur. So that was never the intention of PCR is the, testing. Is the intention really to collect genetic data on people? 
Well, the 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 purpose of PCR is to is to look at a series of uh, a sample and say is that genetic material present? Period. And 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 it but it doesn't do anything more than that. So I've always been mind boggled by the fact that we're using, you know, this test was issued as an emergency use authorization. And now this emergency use authorization PCR test is now being used to determine if other emergency use drugs and vaccines, which are drugs, are, are working. So you've got you know, something that hasn't really been approved for a purpose, checking something else that really hasn't been approved for treatment. Um, <clears throat> so you've got the antigen testing, you've got antibody testing, which tells you if if your body's immune system has responded to it with, with antibodies by B cells, which doesn't even address whether T cells are involved. Um, and, and the biggest problem that I see there is that the antibody tests that are frequently looked for are IgG and IgM. So IgG is chronic. It's uh, the typical Y-shaped antibody that people see, and IgM is the acute phase, which is a pentamer 5 component, which is great. However, this is a respiratory and gastrointestinal primarily virus, and the, the antibody to look for there is IgA. And, and uh, except for one animal study that I saw that was looking at, at SARS-CoV-2, nobody seems to talk about IgA. Um, and then there's tissue. And tissue can be done one of two ways. You can either go in and sample, which is what we've been doing when we go into the lungs with something called bronchoalveolar lavage, which is where we go in the lungs with a fiber optic scope and we look for material. We put some saline in there and suck it back out and try to draw material out and then look at it under a microscope and see if people can agree amongst themselves about what the severity is. Or you can actually do FMTVDM. And that's the real advantage of FMTVDM is the ability to measure the inflammatory thrombotic response, both from the virus infecting an area and the immune response to it in the area. And so the reason why you should listen to me is, A, I produced the theory that actually explains it, and B, I developed the test that can actually measure it. And, and the benefit of FMTVDM or Fleming method is that not only can it define the extent and severity of the disease, but it can monitor treatment real time. And, and the treatments, uh, if the treatments are working, they're going to show up in 72 hours. And the reason for that is that if you look at the drugs that are used, people sometimes wonder how we prescribe medications. And the medications are based upon what's called half-life, or the amount of time it takes for half of the drug to be gone out of your system one way or another. And, and so there's something called plasma steady state uh, concentration or CPSS, concentration plasma steady state. And what, what that means is that it takes five half-lives of a drug to reach that level. And if a drug is going to work for SARS-CoV-2 or high blood pressure or heart failure or or high cholesterol or whatever, it's going to, it's going to work within five half-lives. Um, and so if you look at the drugs that are useful for SARS-CoV-2, um, five half-lives gets you under 72 hours. So uh, FMTVDM was used not only in our study to look at how severe the disease was to begin with um, once they had acquired COVID-19, which is the disease versus the virus. And then 72 hours, every 72 hours, we would modify treatment until we found treatments that worked. And that allowed us to tailor make uh, treatments that actually work for SARS-CoV-2. So that was a long explanation, but unfortunately, I'm not sure there's a shorter one. Uh, you should have, uh, I, I think, unfortunately, in the age of Twitter, people are used to 144 characters. And yet, you know, when you go to university or you really go to a course to learn something, uh, it takes a little bit longer than 144 characters, and, and you can't quite do it on Twitter yet. Well, you've got all the time you want here, and that's a very detailed explanation, and it's a very important explanation because there's been some mud f thrown at people in this business, and uh, some of the mud sticks, and it's very important to get a, a really serious um, and proper explanation. So do feel free to tell us everything. Don't, don't paraphrase anything, but this is not Twitter. Yeah. So um, <laughs> do we want to get on with the presentation, sir? 
Sure, let's go ahead and uh, so this is kind of the abbreviated version uh, of mine and let me see if I can uh, get my screen here a little bit bigger. So uh, yes, I'd love to do that. Let's uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome. Right. And so this is this is obviously uh, a virus that is named after uh, the clinical consequences, uh, which is that it produces severe, acute, sudden respiratory breathing from syndrome. That's how it gets the term SARS. And then COVID-2 is coronavirus 2. And people are used to shoving coronavirus together. Um, we don't do that for any other virus. We don't do that for herpes virus. We don't do that for HIV. We don't do that for respiratory syncytial virus. We don't do it for adenovirus. Um, so this is coronavirus 2. Corona crown, which people are used to seeing, which we have a slide of that we'll show you. And then 2019 was the year that everybody became painfully aware of it, although it's clear, I think, that uh, this virus probably leaked out uh, of the lab in September. And interestingly enough, the computer files at the Wuhan Virology Institute were wiped in June and July of 2019 of, of much of the data surrounding this particular virus. And then potential conflicts of interest, obviously, the uh, FMTVDM and the theory that, that I just talked about. So, you know, I think when you have somebody who gives you a presentation for whatever purpose and they don't define, you know, look, uh, I'm, I'm including what uh, I know and part of what I know is what I've developed. And if they don't admit to conflicts of interest, real conflicts of interest, I mean, you know, uh, as conflict of interest that I'm breathing oxygen on the, uh, on the planet and therefore I might have a conflict of interest of what's going on in the air. Um, it needs to be a legitimate uh, conflict of interest. So um, conflict of interest are, are an interesting thing. Uh, there's a lot of people who, who love to jump on just about anything as a conflict of interest. Um, I think serious conflicts of interest are the ones to point out, like I just pointed out, because, you know, you could... You, it's 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 a valid it's a valid uh, statement in question. I think we're going to see a lot of conflicts of interest uh, in the United States and uh, virology uh, Wuhan Virology Institute in the next few slides, uh, and things that are actually going on. And I think those conflict of interests um, are critical for people to know. And it it's astonishing to me. Um, you know, I'm. This year is, I think, my 52nd, possibly 53rd year of doing research. And um, it's astonishing to me what people consider as credible scientists. We have a lot of people that uh, are playing what I consider pseudoscientists uh, because they just love to, to, to be part of the conversation. And I understand that. I mean, you know, you go to a party. We used to go to parties and, and people would... Uh, uh, always want to be part of the conversation. I get that. But there's a point in time uh, to listen at the conversation and, and, and to learn something from the people that do know what they're talking about instead of uh, pretending to. And I, I have some real concerns about many of the people that have been um, involved in the discussion about SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I, <clears throat> I don't think it's in the slide, although it may be. But one of the points uh, of... Uh, of the importance of science is that in 2007, there was a, a research project funded by the National Science Foundation. And it, the research was done at the University of Indiana um, <clears throat> in France and in Italy. And the function of that research project, which was an infectious disease research project, <clears throat> was to determine what do you do if you believe that you have a, a virus or a bacteria or a fungus or some type of biological uh, entity that it has the potential of producing a pandemic. And the conclusion of that study was that you immediately shut down international travel. <clears throat> now, the reason for pointing this out at this point in time is that <clears throat> when, when SARS-CoV-2 occurred and the president of the United States at the time, President Donald Trump, um, was making a decision about w whether to shut down international travel or not. He shut down international travel um, despite 
the recommendations from Dr. Anthony Fauci at the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, who said shutting down the travel was not important. So Dr. Fauci has frequently been viewed as America's scientist, right? I mean, it, it's hard to turn on the television or the internet and and uh, not hear him being described as that. So here he is. He is uh, head of NIAID, the very government agency that should be aware of any research that was done like this and that was published in 2007. And so at the time, this expert scientist, uh, physician, I remember, made a comment that it wasn't necessary to shut down international travel. And the problem that I have with that is that as a credible scientist in charge of the U.S. organization, in charge of infectious diseases, that should have known about a study paid for by the National Science Foundation, uh, he, he recommended that travel did not need to be shut down. So either he was unaware of it, um, had read it, but had forgotten it, um, or had some other reason for for not making that statement. But he didn't come up and say, well, I'm not sure I agree with this, but, you know, Mr. President and, and people of the United States and the world, you know, there was this study done <laughs> and paid for uh, out of the U.S. back in 2007. And yet his, his, his comment was not to shut down international travel. And so as a scientist, as a credible scientist, you know, when everybody talks about, you know, stepping up, I mean, look, at one point in time, I told people that you needed two doses of these isotopes to do uh, cardiac imaging, because that was the party line I was told. That was what I was publishing papers on. But I eventually acquiesced and said, wait a minute, that that's incorrect. Uh, at one point in time, I told people that cholesterol was primarily the thing driving heart disease. But, you know, over the course of time, I've, I've turned around. And I've said, well, you know, it's it's not. I mean, it's a, it's a part of it, but it's certainly not necessary. And, and it plays a different role in different people. So, you know, I to set the record straight, it's this inflammatory process that that, you know, I put the theory uh, with my name attached to it. Um, I have people that come and listen to me at presentations and literally they have said, well, Dr. Fleming, that's not what you said five years ago. And, you know, one of the first things that comes to my mind is that I think you must have really a very boring life if you're watching me and following me around the world. I've been in London. I've been at the QE2 Center uh, lecturing on on heart disease and, uh, and inflammation. Um, <clears throat> I think it may have been one of the first places that I actually talked about where I talked about cholesterol and triglycerides and fibrinogen and homocysteine and live protein low A and, and, and bacteria and viruses. And, and in fact, I did it in the Fleming conference room at QE2. So um, it, it was a little bit surreal uh, doing that. But, uh, you know, I, I always tell people, look, you know, I, I have no idea what I'm going to say until, you know, the, the, the presentation comes up and... Um, I'm putting together the, the most recent data because my goal is to put together what's right to just make yourself look good because I think the way that you make yourself look good is, is you present the real data. And then the, the beauty of, of doing it properly is that other people will eventually report very similar things so that, you know, the inflammation and heart disease theory, which is what I will always call it since I came up with it, is now considered by many scientific fact. But because I came up with it, I will always only call it a theory. Um, the work that we did for treatments of SARS-CoV-2, um, many other individuals, which we'll get to in, in slides, um, have done similar things, although, you know, not with randomized controlled clinical trials as we did, but um, they're coming up with the same numbers. And not only does that validate my work, but I view it also that my work then helps to validate theirs. And it's that consistency that provides scientific integrity and, and knowledge and moving forward, as opposed to uh, continuing to behave uh like ostriches with their heads in the sand, you know, just hoping and praying that the world will get better on its own. And I, as you're going to see here in the course of the next few slides, that's not going to happen naturally. Well, science is evolving, and uh, we have another slide here. Do you wish to go to that now? Yes, please. 
So one of the obvious reasons for people to listen to this presentation is because it's important to them. I mean, SARS-CoV-2 has produced a pandemic around the world, although at this time I would argue it's an endemic because it's here, it's not going anywhere. It's produced a devastating loss of lives. I'm not sure if we're up to 2 million uh, internationally. I know we're over 500,000 in the US. Although I would argue that the vast majority of that is a failure to actually treat the inflammatory response more so than just the virus itself. It's separated people. It's I mean, it's isolated people in lockdowns. It's prevented people from seeing family members in the hospital, in nursing homes, the absence of family gatherings and social events. I mean, human beings are social beings and it's our interaction with each other that that gives us uh, much of who we are. And so stripping that away from people has been a very effective tool for controlling and and uh, preventing people from from truly uh, sharing information. And it also then forces people to depend upon certain other sources to get their news. And if that news source is controlled, I'm not saying it is, but if it's controlled, um, then, then the uh, then what you hear and believe is exactly what you're, they people want you to hear and believe. Uh, it's it's resulted in a tremendous loss of personal liberty, not just in the United States but all over the world. I mean, I certainly watched a lot of what was going on in the UK uh, with the lockdowns, um, and you can see the fear and the devastation of people. It also resulted in the circumvention of protective mechanisms, as we're going to see here with gain of function, uh, because there were mechanisms put in place to stop things like gain of function research from going on. And yet the very people that are now held up as, you know, the the heroes and the people to listen to as scientists appear to be the same people who have circumvented the protections to prevent uh, something like gain of function disaster that's happened. And it has resulted in the largest experimental study in the history of mankind, and by that I mean the vaccines, because the vaccines as we know them are experimental drugs. These emergency use authorizations mean exactly that, they are experimental. And in the absence of informed consent and people being told what these vaccines really do and how they work and what their potential benefits are and what, and what isn't known without that uh, informed consent, there are a number of national and international laws being broken, and, and people need to be held legally and criminally accountable for doing that. <clears throat> well, the target of this is to provide informed consent. Absolutely. I mean, informed consent is something that happens between a doctor and a patient. And I know we don't address too much the vaccines in this PowerPoint. So let me take a brief moment here, since YouTube saw fit to uh, have removed the emergency use authorization discussion that I just did on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, although they left up the emergency use authorization uh, explanations that I did of the Pfizer Moderna vaccines. The we're going to get to the fact that this is a gain of function virus, which means that the genetics of this virus are man made, or at least man modified. And that means that the mRNA in the Pfizer Moderna vaccines are also man made, non real. They are not naturally occurring. So when people acquire this virus from person to person by respiratory pathway, the amount of virus that can actually infect a cell is limited to the ACE receptor. Now, in fairness, the ACE receptor is not the only receptor that's involved. There is a TMPRSS2 or transmembrane protein uh, series 2 receptor along with the ACE2 receptor, the furin cleavage site, and neuropillin 1. So Let's 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 go to this, and we can hit on the on the vaccines later on here. This is uh, evidence that uh, the United States is directly involved in the payment and federal funding of the development of SARS-CoV-2 through something called gain of function research. And gain of function means you have increased the ability of the virus to infect and cause pathogenic problems within people. So the original look at, at uh, that we're doing here begins with NIH grant AI 23946-08 that was issued to Dr. Ralph Barrick at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. 
Now, to be fair, Dr. Barrick is not the only one involved in the United States, but we're going to focus on, on one of the major groups of individuals here because his research began roughly about 2000 to 2002. And this NIAID grant issued out of Dr. Fauci's control was issued in 2003. And most researchers will tell you that a grant really pays for what has already been done because the federal government likes to see results for its work. So the way it routinely happens is you do research, you get a result, you submit a grant for that, and then that funding gets used for the next phase of research, plus it pays for what you already did. And, and that allows you to then turn around and tell the federal government, see, I actually accomplished something with your money. Because if you did it the other way, the way that everybody else thinks that research is done, you got a grant to do something, then you went and you did it, and it didn't pan out. Well, you would never get another grant because the government would say, well, that was wasted money. We got nothing for it. Bye-bye. Don't come back to us. So in 2003, Barrick began his work on the family of viruses called coronaviridae or coronaviruses. And he did it for the express purpose of increasing uh, some general research, detection, manipulation, potential therapeutics, but also for enhancing the pathogenicity of this virus. And by the 21st of May 2000, Barrick reported that he has successfully rescued infectious clones uh, of the virus through reverse genetics. And what you're seeing is that these reverse genetics then got played over to, uh, by April of 2002, uh, to recombinant DNA. And what you're seeing in the image here is a, a, a host plasmid, which is a circular set of DNA, in which you insert from another species genetic material and that's called recombinant or chimeric DNA. So a chimer is, in old days, Greek mythology, uh, what Roman mythology was, you know, a lion and a dragon and multiple animals put together. That's a chimer. And the goal of his April 2002 outcome was that he produced an infectious, re replicable, defective coronavirus. And it was funded, again, by National Institutes of Health, um, thanks to the U.S. taxpayers. And it, it should be noted that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has been funding amplification research along this line between 1999 and 2002, which is before the original SARS-CoV virus uh, was detected in China. Uh, Specifically, uh, SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, if we look at it, Dr. Shang Li in 2002 reported uh, uh, work inserting an HIV pseudovirus, glycoprotein-120 insert, into SARS-CoV-1. Um, the 2007 grant there is the uh, information I referred to earlier with the travel ban uh, should uh, anybody have uh, reason to believe that there's an infection that is going to become a pandemic to shut down uh, international travel? That's Indiana University. I think I said the University of Indiana before. My apologies to them. Um, in 2013, uh, the Middle Eastern variety showed up, which had a significant uh, morbidity and mortality of uh, 30 to 40 percent. It showed up not only in the Middle East, but also South Korea. Um, research at that point in time, that blue does not show up very well, my apologies, um, showed that rhesus macaques that were infected with it uh, responded well if ribavirin and interferon alpha-2 beta were used. But the important thing uh, above and beyond the fact that the animals could be treated successfully was that you had to begin treatment almost immediately. And this is true of any viral infection. And so delays by telling people to simply go home and only come into a hospital or be seen if they become extremely symptomatic loses valuable time in controlling a viral infection that needs to be addressed sooner than later. Uh, by 2013, uh, uh, Zhang Li and the Wuhan Virology Institute reported that they'd isolated three bats uh, viruses uh, with an HKU4 uh, spike protein. That's, that spike protein itself was not able to infect people, although thanks to some re-engineering that they did in 2015, 
with two single mutations. So this is Shang Li and 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 uh, Zhang Li rather um, telling us directly that they intentionally altered this HKU spike protein to allow it to infect human cells. Uh, by 2015, Barrick and Zhang Li had was warning the world that in fact not only could they build mute uh, chimeric uh, viruses, non-naturally occurring viruses, uh, but they could make more dangerous, virulent, and infectious ones. So that was 2015. We should have been forewarned. Interestingly enough, in 2018, one of the uh, major presentations that was done uh, in Shanghai uh, on, on bat viruses, coronaviruses, and cross-species infectivity uh, presented in November 2018 has since been deleted from the university website. If anybody has that, I'd love to get a copy of it. I've heard from it, but I'm a skeptic because I'm certainly the type of person who believes in, uh, in seeing it for myself. So if we're able to share, I might be able to show this. And what I'd really like to do at this point in time is to uh, see if I can show the next slide to you. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. <clears throat> and so, uh, share screen if I can. <clears throat> and I believe you can see that. And so, this is <clears throat> a virologist interviewing interviewing uh, Peter Dazak, and I edit, editorialized here a couple times for people, and hopefully this will be loud enough for you to hear and uh, certainly make people aware. What you're going to hear is a series of conversations between this virologist and Mr. Dazak, who is in charge of EcoHealth. Mr. Dazak got federal funds uh, through Dr. Fauci and a variety of other federal agencies to do gain-of-function research, and he pays Ralph Barrick, you'll hear him make a comment that they pay Ralph Barrick at the University of North Carolina to do some of this, and then you're going to hear a segment with an Italian research uh, a journalist uh, talking with Dr. Ralph Barrick, uh, where he admits that you know, and, and this is news, I think, probably to most people, we don't actually need the viruses anymore. We we know the genetic codes of most things, including SARS-CoV-2. Um, and the Human Genome Project completed in about 2002-2003, where we were able to sequence the vast majority of the human genome. And so we're very good now at, at uh, finding out what makes something. And one of the things about Moderna is that it started off as Darwinian, I think it was chemical or something, uh, which, you know, uh, is responsible for one of the mRNA uh, vaccines. But uh, as an, it got originally grant funding from the U.S. government, and its purpose is to produce life from non-life. So to take the genetic sequence, put it together and put it inside cells to get uh, viruses and other life forms uh, to to exist by simply sequencing the genetic material. And then you're going to hear uh, uh, Ralph Barrick admit that if they didn't want you to know that what they made was made in a human lab, uh, they can make it look like it's naturally occurring. So let's listen to these few minutes, if you would, please. But if you, you say these are diverse uh, coronaviruses and you can't vaccinate against them, there are no antivirals, what, what yeah. do we... What do we do? Well, so I, I think that coronavirus is a pretty good, I mean, neurovirologists, you know all this stuff, but they, you can um, manipulate them in the lab pretty easily. It's yeah. just spike protein drives a lot of what happens with the yeah. coronavirus, uh, zoonotic risk. So you can get the sequence. Emphasize here, the spike protein drives it, and you can get the genetic sequence. And build the protein. And we work with Ralph Barrick at UNC mm -hmm. to do this. Um, insert into the backbone of another virus right and do do some work in the lab right. in other words a chimer he's admitting that eco health with the funds that have been provided from the federal government has worked with professor barrick at the university of north carolina to take one part of a coronavirus and another part of some other virus and a coronavirus and insert the spike protein that will infect people into the naturally occurring coronavirus by having the genetic sequences to do that and make a chimer. <clears throat> this is Professor Barrick 
being interviewed by an Italian investigative journalist on viruses and his work with Dr. Shang Li, her work with them at University of North Carolina and his work with them, with her over at Wuhan Institute of Virology. We had no access to the viruses in China. All we had was access to the sequence. There were two teams in the world who were very good at making chimeric viruses, and they were both working on SARS-like coronaviruses. One in North Carolina under Ralph Barrick, and one in Wuhan under Xi Zhengli, and they both developed techniques for combining two different parts of one of different viruses into one virus, the backbone of one virus and the spike protein from another virus. Can you hide that? They warned the world in a publication in 2015 jointly between Professor Barrick's team, uh, Xi Zhengli's team. What you're going to hear next should concern you even more because here is the admission from Barrick and Shang Li that this investigative reporter found in the published documents that they can make an even more virulent, nasty Frankenstein's monster, Keimer, to cause a pandemic. That they were capable of making more dangerous pathogens and that this was a risky line of research. Avete dato al virus una marcia in più? Lo avete potenziato? The only gain of function that occurred in that virus is that we changed its antigenicity. And what that data tells you is that any vaccine or antibody that you made against the original virus from 2003 wasn't going to protect the public against any new this new virus if it should emerge in the future. Se guardassimo il genoma della vostra chimera capiremmo che era stata fatta in laboratorio. Anything that we build in the laboratory has a has what are called signature mutations. It's like a little, um, it's where you sign your name, almost, it says, he put in these mutations and it says, this, this was built from, from material in the Barrick Laboratory. Ma se non vuoi lasciare questa firma, puoi costruire in laboratorio un virus indistinguibile da un naturale, giusto? It is correct, you can do it and without leaving a signature, yes. We're using any of the uh, three or four different approaches for coronaviruses that were developed by different researchers, uh, you can leave no trace that it was made in the laboratory. Okay, so I will get that to you and you can play it in the edit. How's that? Does that work? That'll be fine. <clears throat> okay, perfect. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's really outstanding to listen to and to actually listen to somebody admit <laughs> that they have done this. Um, go. That's, your next go. That's your next slide from okay, this end. perfect. Perfect. Thank you. So this is uh, this is a nice example of some of the funding that has been paid to Peter Dasek at EcoHealth with the express purpose of uh, gain of function research. And what you notice at the very top with Health and Human Services, you'll see I highlighted in yellow the NIPFA virus, which is uh, currently in the in in the India subcontinent. And my understanding is that. Uh, the uh, the mortality uh, is uh, right around 100% for the NIPA virus. Uh, Peter Dazak and and his group at EcoHealth is involved in experimentation with the NIPA virus. But you can see here multiple grants by uh, Health and Human Services, multiple grants grants by. Um, uh, both in the upper and lower, and the Department of Defense, which I think is important to realize because the Department of Defense is is not really working with the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts. I mean, the Department of Defense really has only certain specific things that it's doing, and it's all related to military purposes. Um, so you have all of these uh, these grants being provided from the Department of Defense to Peter Dazak at EcoHealth, um, which I think is is fairly significant information to wrap your brain around to say why would a military agency be investing in this so um 
yeah, you really have to ask the question, why is the Department of Defense, why is the National Institutes of Health, why is Health and Human Services all investing this money in EcoHealth and investing money in gain-of-function research? Who's funding it? I mean, who's the person actually <clears throat> deciding to give it to the Department of Defense? Well, we, uh, you know, I, I don't know who has it uh, control of it at the Department of Defense. I think that would be a really good question. Um, but we know who's in charge of it at NIAID. And who is and, that? Uh, that? That would be Anthony Fauci. He's in charge of it. And what about the data which suggests that this was also invented here in the UK at Purbright, the Purbright Institute? Um, I have to admit, I, I, I don't know any of that information, although I have heard that the United States... Um, I've heard that the UK and I've heard that Israel have all been involved in it at one point in time, and clearly China also. So I don't have those papers, um, but certainly if somebody is aware of that, I would love to see them. Because, again, I think that anybody who's been involved in this gain-of-function research um, that produced a virus that then got out and had this devastating effect, and anybody who's interfering with the use of treatments that have been shown to be successful and anyone promoting the use of experimental vaccines without informed consent, that each and every one of these people need to be held legally and criminally accountable. Well, I mean, just, we, just so you understand, that yeah. source that told me that is um, U.S. special forces, which were based in the U.K. and now live in Europe. I, I, you know, I, but that's I all we can no say. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are a number of people. Uh, you know, I get data. I get information from a variety of sources. Um, I have, I have, you know, and I'm not, I guess I'm not going to say anything more than that, um, for the protection of those sources, although those sources will clearly um, stand up. Uh, at, at a point in time that we hold uh, tribunals for these people. Um, but of course, everybody, I think at this point in time is, is, you know, this, I think this is beginning to unravel for these people. I think what, what has happened, uh, you know, I started giving presentations here in Texas about two and a half weeks ago. And one of the things that I have been just admiring and awed by is that the people are not as stupid as I think the people in power that are behind this. That's think a they very, are. very important point. People don't know why they buy a particular car or they buy a particular product, but they know when they're being conned. Right. And they're being conned. Or are they being conned? Is there malice of forethought here? Well, you know, I've tried to I, I try to to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. I mean, even that pharmaceutical company, I tried to give the benefit of the doubt because I thought, well, maybe they just didn't know. But but the reality is, you know, I've done correspondence with them and I've published papers showing the correspondence with them where I've said, you know, wait a minute. Now, here here is the research behind it. And what they've done with the FDA is they've gone to the FDA and they've said, well, the drug, yeah, it redistributes but we don't tell doctors how to practice medicine um and and we don't really care anymore because there's not profit in it for us anymore because it's now generic and it's off you know it's off patent um when you get to the point where you start to see people make decisions after the fact and and they have the information that shows the consequences you know now, now you have to hold them. I think they have to be held accountable. You know, I, 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 you know, people ask questions about why would they be doing gain of function research? Well, gosh, you know, as I've already said, I, with 52 years of research, I will be one of the first people to tell you if there's an interesting research project that I think should be done, and you give me the opportunity to do it, I will probably do it. OK, but there's a point in time that as a researcher, you come, you, you wake up and you go, well, maybe this is more dangerous than than not. And so the point is this, if they were doing research on SARS-CoV-2 with all the best of intentions, whatever that might be, 
you know, they were trying to develop a uh, treatment regimen in case somebody else attacked the country, or they wanted to see what would happen if, if mutations actually happened um, uh, and, and therefore protect people, you know, all, all well and good. But we're past that point. We're at a point now where the, the chimer escaped, okay, either intentionally or, or accidentally. Who knows? But the point is, it happened, and there were consequences, and those consequences continued and snowballed and got worse and worse and worse. And there's millions of dead people now. There, it, it, there's millions of dead people. Uh, nation states have been put at odds against each other. People have lacked, been locked down. Um, even even that first uh, funding that went around to Americans in the United States uh, that was passed in 2020 to to give stimulus checks did so with part of the Patriot Act being re-signed into law. I mean, we're past the point of oops. We're to the point of you did something you shouldn't have done and you didn't tell somebody that there was a problem and you had this knowledge base about how detrimental it was and why are we having to drag this out of you? The fact that you're the fact that the powers that be continue to misrepresent things that all of that speaks poorly it is it, it, it speaks intentional and knowingly and that makes it criminal well these um these sort of questions we can answer or look at Later, do you want to continue with your presentation? Please. Because this is yeah. really fascinating. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, there are I could, there's lots of things I'd like to say, but I prefer to get on. Okay. So, and again, here's more funding from the National Science Foundation, uh, USAID, Department of the Interior, USDA, Department of Health and Land Security. More than sixty-one million dollars, just in what I was able to find, went to EcoHealth for gain of function. And it's not just EcoHealth. If you look at the bottom of the slide, the gain of function research has gone to uh, University of, of Texas and Iowa and Chicago and Maryland. I mean, I'm I'm a graduate of Iowa and UT, um, uh, Vanderbilt University, Washington University. I mean, these are the universities that are doing gain of function research. And we're already seeing the consequences of SARS-CoV-2 of gain-of-function research, which is the production of more infectious viruses. And we know, you know, not only does SARS-CoV-2 uh, produce this inflammatory thrombotic response, but people have gone back and looked at influenza A, and about 12% of all myocardial infarctions uh, damage to the heart, or what, what the lay public calls a heart attack, although they're not quite exactly the same thing, um, is, is caused by an inflammatory thrombotic response. So 12% of the people who die with influenza A die from an inflammatory thrombotic response producing a myocardial infarction in people. So it's not just SARS-CoV-2. The problem is, is that every one of these viruses can be treated, but you have to treat the site of infection, you have to treat the issue of replication, and you have to treat the inflammatory thrombotic response. So not only have the treatments not focused on treating the inflammatory thrombotic response attachment replication, but we've known since the early 2000s how to set ventilators correctly on patients who have this inf inflammation in their lungs associated with these, with these acute respiratory distress syndromes. And, and the truth is, is that the ventilators, every time they breathe for somebody, gives what's called a tidal volume. And that tidal volume is about uh, 10 cc's per uh, kilogram body weight. And it, we know that you have to set it for half of that, or you will stretch the lungs in these patients, cause more inflammation, and kill them. There were three major papers published on that, all by these societies that, that address ventilator settings. So not understanding the inflammatory thrombotic response, not setting the ventilators properly, and you have hundreds of thousands to millions of people that are dead, and all because of a virus that was played with, knowingly played with. You know, these papers, the stuff I showed earlier, these are statements directly from, from Barrick and Zhang, Zhang Li and other individuals admitting that they played with the viruses, inserted HIV glycoprotein-120, 
caused other mutations in the HKU4 spike protein. And as we're going to see, there's a couple of mutations that they haven't admitted to yet that are in the spike protein. So I, I think that's in one of the, uh, it might be in the so next So what you're slide. saying is that basically the ventilators, due to misuse or deliberate misuse, were used to actually terminate the, the people being on those ventilators? They gave them twice as much uh, ventilatory tidal volume each time that they should have, which only caused more lung damage and killed people. So you can make as many ventilators as you want, but if you don't have the ventilator set properly, um, you kill people. I mean, uh, that's what the research and published papers have shown. And what we saw was a scenario where it, it really felt like the medical community across the world, for whatever reason, uh, wasn't getting on board with the right treatments, wasn't getting on board with uh, the the proper settings of the ventilators, you know. And I have to tell you that when I when I see people um, breaking down and crying or saying this is not what they signed up for, this is exactly what we all signed up for. When I was in medical school, HIV hit the scene, brand new. I mean, when I began medical school, there was no such thing known as, as, as HIV. By the time I left medical school, we had had hundreds uh, that our team alone had taken care of. Um, and I know for a fact that the numbers were misrepresented in the press because we would go home and listen to the news and they would talk about how many people were in the entire state. And we would look at each other as students and say, we've got more than that in the hospital. You know, <laughs> so... But you know, sorry. We were are you suggesting that mainstream media would somehow misrepresent the facts for some other agenda? <laughs> I'm just saying that they weren't representing the facts accurately. I'll let I'll let uh, the listeners decide what they want to do. With well, mainstream next slide. Media. Yeah, yeah. So here you can see. I mean, this is just kind of the lineage of, of uh, gain of function research from 2002 to 20 to 2019. And as you saw from the prior slides, the Department of Defense, National Institutes of Health, NIAID. Again, that is the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Disease. If you don't know what that little Y is down below Fauci, that's supposed to be an antibody. Department of Health and Human Services, the FDA. Dr. Fauci is one of the major federal government sources of funding that has gone to Peter Daszak, which is immediately to his left, but center screen. And then Daszak gave it to Barrick and Zhang Li. And then if you look in the bottom left or bottom right corner, as I'm looking at it, that's the Wuhan Virology Institute, the only level four um, virology institute that I know of that's located inside a city. <clears throat> because when you have agents that you believe are toxic that could kill people, you don't put it inside of a city where it can easily get out and infect people. And then up above that, that little tree-like looking structure is what the spike protein actually looks like. So those are that. that's what it looks like when the proteins that make up the spike protein are. And that little bend that you see there is a flexible part of that spike protein that allows the spike to move around and bend and find uh, ACE2 receptors. So here we here you can see this is so why is a spike protein gain of function so important? Well, because it increases the infectivity and then the pathogenicity of of the virus. And there's three that that we know of. Um, one is the HIV pseudovirus glycoprotein 120, which is interesting because the Australians shut down some of their vaccines when they discovered that uh, people were testing positive for HIV. Um, I'm not wondering so much why they tested for it, because I think that would be an intelligent thing to test for if you know that there's an HIV glycoprotein 120 attached. What I'm confused about is why nobody else is testing for it. One of the inserts that nobody's talking about uh, or admitting to in their papers is the proline arginine, arginine alanine, or the PRRA. Now, those letters in the alphabet are just uh, the accepted letters assigned to the different uh, amino acids. Um, so those are the four amino acids inserted. And that amino acid insert is found in no other coronavirus on planet Earth except this man-made spike protein. It is, however, found in rabies virus, it's found in HIV, and it's found in cobra toxin. And then at the very top, you'll see something called a prion-like domain. So 
with the insertion of the HIV glycoprotein 120 in the PRA insert, that has an effect on the rest of the spike protein. And one of the consequences is that at the top, near the at, the at the receptor binding domain of the spike protein, the part of it that attaches to the ACE2 receptor, there is a prion-like domain. And we know that that prion-like domain has been associated with animal studies causing uh, mice exposed to the spike protein. And remember, the spike protein is what's being coded for in the vaccines. That this spike protein crosses the blood-brain barrier exquisitely. In fact, it looks like it's well designed to cross the blood-brain barrier. And it produces amyloid uh, deposits and Lewy bodies, we now know. Uh, about a week, week and a half ago, uh, a group of researchers showed that uh, rhesus macaques, uh, two different uh, varieties, produced uh, Lewy bodies in the brain when they were exposed to the uh, to the uh, spike protein and this uh, uh, prion-like domain. Now, it also produces things like amyloidosis, which is of significance to a cardiologist like myself because of amyloid cardiomyopathies. Um, but admittedly, uh, its involvement in the brain is, is much more of a severe long-term sequelae and potentially short-term sequelae, as you've seen uh, videos of people having all sorts of Parkinsonian and neurologic disorders. In fact, uh, I, I want to mention somebody very important here, uh, Dr. Kevin W. McCarran, who's a neurobiologist uh, in Japan, who's originally from the UK, is probably one of the world's expert experts, uh, if not the world expert, on uh, rhesus macaques and these neurologic uh, brain disorders. Uh, Kevin's one of the people that I've interacted in quite a bit, and he has been impressed that much of these antisocial behaviors that he saw in uh, the, the violence last year in U.S. streets and other cities is exactly the type of uh, animal behavior uh, that happens to uh, rhesus macaques and other animals when the limbic system is interfered with, um, which is one of the targets of this prion-like domain. And so there is uh, real evidence showing that in humanized mice, that this prion-like domain produces uh, spongiform encephalopathy, or what the general public refers to as mad cow disease. Uh, with the deaths of 95% of those mice occurring in two weeks, which is a year and a half for humans. And uh, now the recent uh, macaques a paper that shows the Lewy bodies for Parkinsonian and other types of neurologic abnormalities showing up uh, from the transmission of these spike proteins. And we know that these spike proteins uh, that occur, and we also know that the vaccines that when they are injected do not stay at the site of injection, despite the claims that they do, because uh, one of those pharmaceutical companies, Moderna, published a paper uh, two to three years ago, maybe four now, uh, looking at lipid nanoparticles uh, following the injection into animal models, and the lipid nanoparticles were found all over the body, in the brain, the heart, the bone marrow, the lungs, the liver, and in the muscle where it was injected. So these lipid nanoparticles do not stick around at the site of injection. The vaccines uh, not only produce, eventually uh, result in the production of the spike protein, but the mRNA of the Pfizer and Moderna uh, vaccines uh, appear to reverse transcribe themselves into the DNA of humans. And Johnson & Johnson went one step further instead of using making mRNA again of the spike protein, which is not even naturally occurring, to do their double-stranded uh, DNA of their vaccine, they had to pop out the uracils in the mRNA and replace it with thymidine, and then put a complementary uh, pad, uh, matching DNA there to make DNA. And the focal point of the Pfizer, or rather the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, is that that double-stranded DNA has to go into the human nucleus for it to then undergo transcription to produce mRNA to then leave the, vir leave the nucleus to the nuclear protein core to get out to the ribosomes to translate into spike protein. And the spike proteins um, cross the blood-brain barrier exquisitely, as do the lipid nanoparticles. Do you want that on the next slide? Um, let's go to the next slide. Yes, please. <clears throat> so your original question to me about why anybody should listen to a cardiologist, particularly me, talk about a virus. 
uh, other than the fact that you know Flemings have a notorious history of being involved with infectious diseases. Um, yeah, I think there's some other guy called Fleming discovered something. I'm not sure what it was. Yeah, penicillin. Um, and so, you know, when I came and lectured in the in the QE2 conference center in London several years ago, it was the Fleming conference room from Al Sir Alexander Fleming. So, you know, when I first presented the theory in 94, um, I certainly wasn't hoping that I was going to get it confirmed, which is essentially what SARS-CoV-2 does. But I also pointed out, um, as I show in this in, in that in that slide that we just had up there, that you know, in the green activity that uh, Infectious disease at the very bottom in green was the number one cause of humanity throughout the world prior to the discovery of um, penicillin. And then with the discovery of penicillin and uh, the control of infections, then processing of foods and decreased physical activity, we developed these uh, uh, inflammatory hyper uh, inflammatory thrombotic response diseases like heart disease, obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, cancer, strokes, the list goes on. But I also pointed out that I thought that eventually what would happen is that we would see infectious disease raise its ugly head again as the number one cause of disease this time through this inflammatory thrombotic process. And so you'll see number 11 is infectious disease. And if you look at the upper right-hand corner, actually the, in the entire right half of that diagram, which is in the textbook, shows the sequence about uh, bacteria and viruses activating clotting, activating inflammation, uh, throughout the body and, uh, and, the, and the sequence of steps that actually occur that have to be treated if you're going to stop the inflammatory thrombotic response. So this was the uh, chapter in the textbook in 99 that I, that I published. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some nice examples of uh, why people die with SARS-CoV-2. This is the inflammatory thrombotic response. So if you look in the left half of the Seen, you'll see A and B shows uh, lung parenchyma or the outside of a lung tissue. C shows a blood clot in the lung itself, which is a pulmonary embolus, which means it's traveled from elsewhere in the body to impact itself into the lungs. And so part of the problem with, with oxygenation in the lungs is not only all the fluid that's accumulating from the inflammation, but the thrombosis or blood clot leading to an area that blocks the blood supply and prevents people from, from also picking up oxygen. And then D shows a deep venous thrombosis uh, uh, in the lower extremity that would eventually move up. What you see in the upper right-hand corner are examples of inflammatory cells building up uh, within the lungs and other areas. And, and D in that upper right shows another blood clot, that round circular area. Um, Straight below that, that is a prostate, believe it or not, and, the, and those black areas are blood clots forming in the prostate. And then in the bottom right-hand corner is the most important organ of the human body, which is the heart. Uh, and those uh, uh, purplish cells that you see the arrows pointing to or the inflammatory responses occurring uh, in the heart uh, as a result of the virus itself. So next slide, please. <clears throat> This is an example of uh, the areas of the brain that have been shown to uh, produce Lewy bodies with the spike protein crossing the brain. So uh, you can see the areas are numbered uh, from 1 through 15, showing the actual areas where they've now seen in the rhesus macaques. Uh, the Lewy body formation following infection with the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The slides to the right show uh, actual uh, inflammatory cells, the uh, brownish staining ones in A or the, or the CD3 plus T cells, which are inflammatory, and then the activated microglia or the macrophages that occur in the brain, and those are stained brown. And then you see in the bottom right-hand corner that reddish uh, dark area there. Those are Lewy bodies that have formed in the brains of monkeys uh, within weeks of being exposed to the spike protein. Next slide, please. Uh, so with all of that said and done, and obvious that uh, we had uh, something that needed to be uh, tested for, in January of last year, I began the process of looking uh, at designing a study to determine what treatments work for SARS-CoV-2. Um, 
what I did is I spent several months looking at mechanisms of action. Everybody else, um, well, not everybody else, a lot of people seem to have focused on whether we're treating people with an anti-malarial or an antibiotic in contrast to looking at how those drugs work. And so it's, you know, a, a classic example is that hydroxychloroquine is maybe an anti-malarial, but I don't really care what I know is why. And it turns out that hydroxychloroquine, I'm sorry, uh, sorry. Um, strangely, when you mentioned that particular phrase, your voice and everything stopped. I'm sure there's nothing to that. But if you wanted to repeat that, if you wanted to repeat that, uh, literally just, uh, just everything stopped. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to start again on that point. Sure. I'll, uh, uh, I'll start over with, with looking at the different drugs. So at the beginning of January of 2020, uh, I began looking at possible treatment regimens for SARS-CoV-2 and looked at a variety of different medications that looked like they might work. And my focus was to look at the mechanism of action about why a drug works instead of the classification of what a drug is. So we're, a lot of people were focused on whether a drug was an anti-malarial or an antibiotic or or a vitamin or a mineral, I was much more focused on why these things work. And so a classic example is hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine works not because it's an anti-malarial and has been used for malaria. It, it works uh, for a variety of mechanisms. It works by interfering with the attachment of SARS-CoV-2 to the ACE2 receptor. It works by enhancing the influx of zinc through what's called a zinc ion of ionophore or an ion passage to allow the zinc to get into the cell to um, to have an effect on, on uh, inhibiting um, transcription or RNA-dependent RNA polymerase uh, at the ribosome. Uh, hydroxychloroquine works by slightly increasing the pH inside of a cell to impair the ability of the viral envelope to un uh, unfold, uh, uh, open up, and allow the genetic material out. It works by interfering with glycoprotein 2B3A, thereby interfering with blood clots. It works by down-regulating the TOL7 receptor, which is an inflammatory receptor. Um, and I think there's another mechanism of action. So the, it's not the fact that it's an anti-malarial, it's how it works. The, the, the medications like uh, azithromycin, uh, you know, was not used to prevent a secondary bacterial infection. It was used to um, actually interfere with the replication of the virus. And, you know, part of the research that I wandered across was that azithromycin um, is supposedly only functional in bacterial cells because the size of the ribosomal subunits are different in bacteria than human cells. And so the, the uh, companies that have made antibiotics that interfere with ribosomes have frequently said that it won't bother people because uh, our ribosomes have have, uh, have the wrong subunits uh, and they're different than bacteria. Well, it turns out that that's not true because there was a very nice published study done with Zika showing that azithromycin interfered with the replication of the Zika virus in brain cells, in glial cells. So, um, not only was that not exactly correct information from Big Pharma, but it also pointed to a mechanism of action for actual use with viruses. And so, you know, and primaquin is another one that, that we used. And then clindamycin is another antibiotic that we used, but it was really selected because it interferes with the, uh, the transcription or the rather the translation of the protein at the ribosome. And um, sorry about that. And it interferes with the TMPRSS2 receptor of, of the um, membrane to interfere with the attachment of the um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus to the cells. So it actually turned out that clindamycin was, as you're going to see, uh, extremely, extremely uh, useful for the treatment of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and then we looked at a, a variety of other medications. We looked at remdesivir. We looked at uh, interferon alpha-2 beta. We looked at uh, tocilizumab, which is an interleukin uh, uh, blocker. Um, we looked at convalescent plasma, not as a first-line choice, but as a second-line choice. And... Um, <clears throat> 
I'm sure there's something else I don't remember. We were going to look at uh, losartan, an angiotensin receptor blocker, um, but I decided against that. I, I, I wish we had looked at that. We did not look at ivermectin. Ivermectin wasn't on the radar screen at that point in time. So it took about three to four months for me to design the study and then put it up on the National Clinical uh, Trial site. And then we selected, as you'll see in that, in that slide that you had up, we selected uh, 23 sites from seven countries outside of the United States to actually look at uh, the ability of these treatments. And so we ended up looking at 1,800 people, which to end of the study had to be PCR positive. And again, uh, all that meant to us was that we knew that they had the virus in their nose or their throat. Um, uh, initially, when they came in, uh, they were seen by their physicians, and the physicians made a decision clinically as to whether of the 1,800 people that that came in, they all saw their physician initially. They got a PCR test. If the PCR test was positive, uh, they were enrolled in the study. If the physician thought that they did not need to be treated, they were followed for three days and brought back. If the physician thought that they looked like they needed treatment, they, they clinically were appearing with elevated temperatures and myalgias or loss of smell or any of a variety of symptoms that, you know, what you've all become familiar with, all the, all the viral prodromes. Um, then they had the options of, of four treatment regimens uh, that we used, uh, each of which had an aminoquinoline in it. And then they were brought back in three days. And at the end of that three-day period of time, uh, the physicians then had to make a decision. Either the patient was better and could continue on whatever they were doing, whether it was no treatment or, or the anaminoquinoline treatment, or if they, it looked like they were getting worse, then they were admitted to hospital. And of the 1,800, 501 of them got admitted to the hospital. And so we began in the first phase of the study with 10 different treatment regimens. And so they came in. We did a variety of tests, one of which included uh, FMTVDM, one of which included... Um, okay, uh, I'll put you back up on screen. Yeah. Okay. So of, of, uh, of the 1,800, uh, 501, we were shooting for 500. Um, 501 got admitted to hospital. And once they came into the hospital, they, were, uh, they immediately underwent FMTVDM to measure the uh, severity of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, at that point in time, they were presumed to have COVID-19, which meant that they were clinically uh, presenting with uh, significant enough symptoms to demonstrate that they had the disease now, as opposed to just having the virus. And I think that's an important distinction for people. Um, something Could that you explain that? That's a very important distinction, having the disease or the virus. What, what's the clinical differences in that? Right. And and if you if you read through the EUA of Johnson and Johnson, um, they 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 murkied all of that together. So you know the vast majority of people when they get a virus get a viral infection, and the natural sequence occurs that at about three to five days your immune system responds to that with what's called a T cell response, and that's called the innate acute T cell cytotoxic response which is where your T cells are basically trying to kill off the virus uh, in the cells that have been infected uh, and released chemicals that produce an inflammatory response to try to, to, try to deal with that. Um, and then about seven to 10 days, uh, which back up, uh, that's why most people uh, when they get a viral infection will feel lousy for about four or five days and then they'll start to feel better because that T cell response is actually kicked in and it's doing its job. That, that T cell response is present in all animal species, and that's why it's called the innate uh, immune response. But in upper species, uh, of which I'm glad to say humans are a part, uh, or at least most humans are a part. Um, oh, no. <laughs> um, you have what's called uh, an adaptive humoral antibody response. And that occurs at about seven to 10 days. And that is where the T cells have now presented the antigens to the what's called the B cells and antibodies are made. So for your listeners, T cells get their, their name uh, because they originally uh, start in the thymus gland, a gland in the center of the chest. 
B cells get their name because they're in, in, in fowl and birds, they come from the bursa, and in humans, they come from bone. So T cell, B cell. Um, and, and that makes the antibody response. And, you know, not, it's important to realize that it's not always a good thing to have an antibody response. Uh, and, and let's take a classic example here, strep pharyngitis or strep throat. So streptococcus pneumoniae is present in the throat of every human being on planet Earth. So swabbing your throat to find out whether you have strep really doesn't help anybody. Although I, I understand a lot of people get it done. If you have white plaques, white areas on your tonsils, you have one of just a few things. If, it, if, if, if you swab it off and it bleeds, it's diphtheria. If you swab it off and it's yeasty, it's fungal. If you swab it off and it doesn't do either of those things, then it's probably strep. And so you don't really have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. You know, you have elevated temperature and cervical lymphadenopathy or swollen lymph nodes and, and, and uh, white plaques in your throat. You have strep, streptococcus pneumonia in your throat, and you need to be treated. And the reason why you need to be treated with antibiotics, thank goodness for Fleming, um, is that uh, penicillin is that you want to kill the bacteria, but you also want to prevent the body from making antibodies. And the reason for that is that the antibodies that you make to streptococcus pneumoniae or strep throat also recognize the valves of your heart as looking awfully, awfully similar. And so those antibodies will actually attack the mitral and aortic valves of your heart and produce something called rheumatic heart disease. And over time, that makes your valves stiffer, and eventually you have to have those valves replaced. And once you get those valves replaced, we have really kind of signed your death sentence because um, those valves will only last so long. And so you're gonna get one valve replaced and you might luck out and get a second valve, but there's only so much tissue in the heart to sew into. And so that means you, you really, at maximum, are going to get two valves replaced. And, and since they each last 10 to 15 years, you, you essentially then sign somebody's you know, death certificate on how long they're going to live. Um, unless you give them a, a heart transplant, I guess. Um, but uh conventionally that's the, the, the that's how that's done and so that's why just because you can make antibodies doesn't mean it's a good thing and so just because you can make antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 or anything else doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing um just a, just an important point for for people to understand so when we when these 501 people eventually got admitted to the hospital they had an fmtvdm study and they had ferritin and they had interleukin 6 to look for inflammation and they had a variety of other tests that were done and we also looked at the qt uh, corrected interval for prolongation to determine if there was a problem with with a rhythm disturbance and i think it's important to note that despite all the 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 uh concerns about aminoquinolones like hydroxychloroquine and primaquine and chloroquine that <clears throat> I'm yet to see a paper, and again, if your listeners can find one, I'd be happy to read it, where it has actually been shown that the use of these drugs have produced uh, a heart rhythm problem in the patients taking it. And that was what all the fuss was about with, with hydroxychloroquine, that it was going to produce these heart rhythm disturbances. Well, you know, the truth of the matter is that there's not a single paper that I've read, seen, or heard about that has uh, shown ventricular polymorphic dysrhythmia or tachydysrhythmias or trousseau de poids, which are the two rhythms that would occur with QT prolongation. So despite all the, the, the uh, press and media attention to this, um, I'm yet to see a case where it's been an issue. And in our study, we also included calcium and magnesium being given to everybody and made it available for IV esmolol to be used, which is a, a medication that will slow down the heart rate. And one of the consequences is that it shortens QT intervals. So I think most patients are aware that uh, when physicians prescribe medications for people, there are potential complications and side effects. And one of the questions that we ask is, how beneficial is the drug and how serious is the side effect? And you know, clearly uh, the treatment of, of this virus is not meant for six to 12 months. I mean, this is something that's, that's you know, a week or two. Um, 
done properly, and so you're not using it long term. And so I think we could all suffer along if we had to have IV esmolol for for a week or two just to allow us to continue with medications that are interfering with the virus. Um, that being said, it wasn't necessary in any of the 501 people that were that were admitted to hospital. Uh, it's also true that the inflammation uh, produced with the infection can prolong the QT. So seeing the QT prolong in these patients doesn't mean it's the hydroxychloroquine. I mean, it could just simply be the infection and the inflammatory thrombotic response itself. So is it the chicken or the egg? Is it the infection or the treatment? And and uh, that's why you have physicians that are supposed to be in charge of this that uh, that take care of the patients and make clinical decision-making skills. And uh, I would argue not uh, people that are uh, in charge of medical boards or in charge of government agencies uh, telling physicians which drugs they can use because the practice of medicine has always been that once the FDA approves a drug for a treatment, physicians use the clinical skills and expertise to determine if a drug can be used for what's called off-label purposes as long as patients sign informed consents, uh, something that's not being done for the experimental vaccines. Uh, so, I, I, uh, are next, you saying that maybe politicians and corporate bodies are playing politics with people's lives? Yeah, uh, what I'm saying is that the interference from all of these individuals with the, with physicians practicing medicine has not only confused medicines, uh, medicine itself, and and scared physicians from using treatments, but they're interfering with the practice of medicine, and frankly, they're practicing medicine without a license. No. I think maybe I think that maybe that's an opportunity to go to the next slide. Yes. So the next slide actually shows um, what it looked like. Um, this is, uh, to the far left, this is what FMTVDM looks like. Now, the, the actual slide that you're seeing, there was one that we published earlier that uh, demonstrates that Gompers and Laird, two different uh, oncologists, uh, back some 60, 70 years ago now, had proposed that the process of cells changing from normal to cancer went through a series of steps going through an inflammatory uh, process to precancerous to cancerous stages was a quad quadratic function. I'd like to take credit for the fact that they proposed that, but that would be wrong because they proposed it. I can take credit for the fact, I guess, that we proved it with FMTVDM because you can see what is a quadratic uh, sigmoidal curve here, uh, confirming that they were Gompers and Laird were both correct on that. But if you look at the range between 150 and roughly 250, you'll see an area called inflammatory and thrombosis and infection. And that is exactly what we see with SARS-CoV-2. So the center part looks at a, a lady, a uh, female patient, uh, three slash one, which means she came from the third study site. She was the first patient. She entered phase one uh, of, the, of the study treatment. And I should explain that phase one is where we started with a single treatment and every three days, modified treatment based upon the outcome of FMTVDM, ferritin, interleukin-6. And so if people got better, significantly by definition would be an FMTVDM drop of 25 or more, uh, they were kept on that treatment. If they got worse, which was an FMTVDM increase of more than 25, the first drop drug would be stopped and a second one would be randomly assigned. So everybody got randomly assigned which drugs they got. And then if they, they were somewhere in between there, they, they didn't really show improvement or deterioration. We took the position that there might be some benefit, but then we randomly added a second one. And so what this meant was that with 10 drug combinations that got layered, we were able to see the outcomes of 52 different drug treatment combinations. In this lady's case, she failed phase, uh, entered phase one after failing treatment one as an outpatient, which was hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And she came in, her initial FMTVDM was 195, so greater than 150 is elevated. Ferritin was 302 nanograms per milliliter, and that's elevated. And then interleukin six at six at or interleukin six at 45 was elevated, and she randomly um, had added to her treatment regimen treatment number eight, which was methylprednisolone. And three days later, I had the studies repeated, and you can see that the FMT VDM value uh, improved to 170, which is exactly 25. Ferritin improved, but still not normal. Interleukin-6 improved, but still not normal. So she was kept on this. And in fact, 
this was one of the drug treatment, one of the three drug treatment regimens that we concluded was, was uh, effective in 99.83% of the patients that were hospitalized. So you had asked me earlier to, to, uh, to comment on something. SARS-CoV-2 is an infection. And your body typically will respond to a viral infection and you have aches and pains and an elevated temperature as your body tries to kill off the virus and the cells infected with heat and respond to it. And that is a viral infection. But when that viral infection starts to have an inflammatory response, it's gotten out of control for a variety of reasons, now you have the disease. Well, who has the disease in SARS-CoV-2? The people that have immune systems that are out of, out of balance. Now, who are those? They're either the immune naive people, the, the children who do not have a finely tuned inflammatory system, and they're now calling that a multi-system inflammatory disease, but it's really, they have an immune naive system producing inflammatory response or diabetics, or you have people with comorbidities. They have these hyperinflammatory states. They have diabetes or heart disease or advanced age or high blood pressure or strokes or cancer. So their immune system is already activated at, a, at an increased level of inflammation because they already have these underlying diseases. Now you throw on to that SARS-CoV-2, which antagonizes the system, as noted in the theory that I first presented, and you have an increased potential for inflammation and blood clotting. And without treatment of that inflammation and blood clotting, people die. Um, so that's the disease part of it. So you have to separate, or I would argue, you need to separate conceptually the difference between having the virus and having the disease. It's kind of like having high cholesterol and having heart disease. You can have high cholesterol and it's not good for you. It's clearly a problem. I mean, nobody has ever done a study that shows that high cholesterol is good for anybody. However, once it starts to produce the inflammation and thrombosis in the blood vessels. Now you have coronary artery disease. So there's a difference between things that can produce a problem and the actual problem itself. And you have to address those intelligently and separately. Next slide, please. <clears throat> As a result of those, those 52 treatment combinations, what we then did is started phase two, where we brought people in and just started with the drug combinations, which shouldn't be a big surprise because HIV as a classic virus for treatment requires multiple drugs to treat the problem. In the outpatient setting, we saw the, there, there were four different treatment combinations that we allowed people to have. 100% of the people who were PCR positive, whose physicians saw them and said, you're symptomatic, we need to do treatment, we need to get on top of this. 100% of the patients who got a primaquine, clindamycin, hydroxychloroquine combination got better, 100%. 97.9% of the people that were on hydroxychloroquine and clindamycin combination got better. 74.2% got better if they were on hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, 69.1% of hydroxychloroquine and doxycycline. Now, if you average those numbers out, they come out to about 83%. And amazingly enough, when you look at other people that are talking about using hydroxychloroquine or aminoclonulins in the outpatient setting, 83% is what they're coming up with across the board, whether it's Zelenko or McCullough or the people in Italy or, or just anywhere in, in India. You know, if, when you look at the, at the papers that are being published or at least the preprints, because there's a huge effort, a huge effort to block uh, this, this research from beginning published. I mean, I literally sent this paper um, which is 12,000 words. Uh, and, and, and for your, your listeners, a typical <laughs> scientific research paper is three to 4,000 words. Um, has a couple figures, a couple tables. This has had over 12,000 words, 12 tables, eight figures. 
There simply wasn't any other way to do this. You know, most of the clinical trials that are done uh, look at one drug, remdesivir. You know, and in our research, if, if the patient did not get an aminoquinoline first and they got started in remdesivir, it only worked 28% of the time, which is less than chance. Because if you can get better, worse, or stay the same, that's a one-third, 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 33 and a third, and 28% is how you perform, that's underperforming chance, one-third. So I'm really unimpressed with uh, remdesivir, but clearly other people uh, found a way to get it to be used. And for the people that it works for, I'm, I'm delighted. In fact, one of the interesting things in the study is that remdesivir, for some reason, I have no idea why, I think it would be interesting to look at, the people in Belgium that got remdesivir did better than anywhere else. So I can, I, I presume there's some genetic something going on there, which I think would be fascinating because I think it would be uh, useful to know number one. And number two, I think it would be helpful for remdesivir um, for that company to know what it is that, that, that targets it. Because, you know, it's the, the better you can target a drug and the more effective it is, the better it is for everybody, the drug company, the patients, everybody. So, well, maybe okay, it's next, the beer uh, or the uh, chocolate. <laughs> Well, being Fleming, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I would agree uh, with probably that. <laughs> Just sort of lighten the load here. Yeah, yeah, you know. No, I mean, um, yeah, <laughs> no, I get it. Um, if, if you want really good chocolate, uh, get it from Belgium. Yeah. What is that? The food, you know, uh, British food is... Uh, Oh, I forgot the expression for it, but it's certainly not, you know. Well, apart from the roast beef, it's almost a contradiction in terms, and I'm that's we're in enough trouble already, <laughs> so we'll we'll just okay. There you go. The, the next there slide, yeah. Well, I have I have had some good roast beef in yeah. in, in London. Yeah. Roast um, beef. Then. Um, and then for the inpatients, what we saw and, and it was an interesting phenomenon, even in the people that seem to need to be admitted after having an aminoquinoline. Um, it somehow seems to prime the system, whether, you know, and again, we don't, I don't know, but it somehow seemed to prime it because if they received an aminoquinoline as an outpatient, they responded almost immediately either with the administration of methylprednisolone or the administration of tocilizumab and interferon alpha 2 beta. And uh, I, I don't think people would be too hard pressed to, to jog their memories to try to think of a public figure that admitted to taking hydroxychloroquine before getting sick and then when he went into the hospital within 36 hours had responded to methylprednisolone. You wouldn't be talking about a prime minister of a certain country, would you? Well, well President Trump is, is, you know, is who I'm thinking about. But, you know, well, if Boris? Prime, uh, did, did he also get that I think thing? he got something similar, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's extremely... Um, extremely useful combination. And if they didn't get an aminoquinoline as an outpatient, what we discovered was the, the combination of primaquin, clindamycin, tocilizumab, and interferon alpha-2 beta was hugely successful. What we saw over the course of this study was that hospital times reduced from four to, uh, four to six weeks, sometimes eight weeks, down to one to two weeks. The number of people that were put on ventilators was substantially reduced. We lost three people out of 1,800. All three of them were on ventilators. All three died within five days. And do you think that One, may have been improper use of the ventilators? I would like to think not because we, as part of the protocol for how to use the ventilators, we, we had set it at, at five milliliters per, per kilogram body weight. So, you know, they were supposed to be following that. And again... Um, you know, we lost two in the first phase, which is where we were doing layering, and one in the last, in phase two. Um, no death is, uh, is ever, um, welcome. You know, it's easy to say people were going to die, some people were going to do that anyway, but, um, it's, it's never felt good for me to lose a patient under any set of circumstances. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, we'll get on with the next slide. Yep. So it, uh, every, you should also know that everybody also received uh, 
the following. They received immune support, which included uh, B6 vitamins, B6, B12, B9. They got magnesium, calcium. They got uh, dehydroepiaterosterone. They got vitamin C. They got zinc. And they got uh, a 125-dihydroxychalate calciferol or vitamin D. Um, The other thing is that everybody that I've ever met in my life who came into a hospital who had a respiratory problem got breathing treatments. They got nebulizers or inhalers to relax their airways so they could breathe better. So everybody here had Atrovan. And for the life of me, I have no idea why people are not getting that across the board. We would do that for any other any other respiratory problem in the world. Why is it not being done for these patients? And then they all, excuse me, though, they all got heparin subcutaneously because way back when I, when I was a medical student in the dark ages, um, in the early 80s, uh, we learned to put everybody on sub-Q heparin, 5,000 units sub-Q to Q 12 hours, to reduce the potential for forming a blood clot if they were going to be in bed. Well, the, the, the common denominator for all these patients coming to the hospital, other than the fact that they're being isolated from family members, which boggles my mind is that they're all in bed rest. They're not being moved around. So if you want somebody to form a blood clot, that's a great way to do it. And these people are dying from blood clots. So again, it just boggles my mind that that this is not being done across the board. And I'm going to make my my statement here about uh, hospitalized patients, that there is no good reason for these patients to not have their family members in there. I mean, if you want to put them in a spacesuit, PPE, to visit their family members. Uh, I will tell you as a physician that people have gotten better, not because of the care I've given them, but because of the fact that they had family members that were there with them. And I say that because there have been times that I've taken care of patients that they have made recoveries that I can only look at people and go, well, I really, I did everything I could think of, but I'm not convinced it was me. I'm thinking it might have been the fact that they wanted to live. Um, because of their family members and loving I mean, care and and yeah and loving care and and frankly i you know as as you know compassion and concerned as i am about my patients i can't give to a patient what the people that means most to them do i personal story my father when he had his bypass operation <clears throat> Um, I remember this. He, you know, I was a, I, I was a, a medical student, and uh, he ended up needing a bypass operation. We got him scheduled, and I came back, and my then wife was pregnant with our first child, and uh, my father, uh, several hours after they completed surgery, was still on the ventilator, still unconscious. You know, well past the time he should have woken up, and people were worried. And I was there with my dad and talking with him. And I leaned over and I gave my dad a kiss. And I said, this is from Stephanie. That was, and he knew the name of his unborn granddaughter. And my father's eyes flashed wide open. And he, I mean, he almost sat straight up in bed. It's like, okay, okay. (laughs) Um, Not me. It wasn't me being around, but knowing that his granddaughter would be waiting for him, that his unborn granddaughter was what it took for my father to come out of his coma. Um, You can't bottle that, you can't sell that, you can't prescribe that, and you can't give it other than from the people that have it to give. A reason to live, a reason to look forward to something. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, And frankly, we need the family members in the hospital giving that to the patients. <clears throat> so, okay. Well, the next slide. Next slide. Um, so one of the one of the key determinants that a research paper is valid is more than just simply getting published. Because yes, that's a lot of hurdles to get through. And I review for something like 16 or 17 journals, two of which I resigned from during 2020 due to ethical concerns. I resigned from British Medical Journal Open Quality and I resigned from The Lancet because of their roles in this entire fiasco with SARS-CoV-2. And particularly after Peter Daszak uh, published 
with a with a series of other people in the Lancet that this virus was a zoonotic or naturally occurring way back at the beginning of 2020. That that's not the function of a scientific or medical journal, and so I resigned from both of those journals. Um, you know, which are which are prestigious journals, but they no longer are, in my view. And, and are you and, saying they've been bought? They certainly act like they have. Um, the New New England Journal of Medicine uh, to allow Bill Gates to uh, to publish editorials in a New England. I mean, Bill Gates may have a lot to know about computer viruses, but he knows nothing about human viruses. And if he does, then then I'm concerned about why he would know something about human viruses, because he's a computer guru. Um, he's not a, a physician and he's not a scientist. So the fact that the New England Journal of Medicine allows him to write editorials is mind boggling. And it takes the credibility out of the New England Journal of Medicine, as far as I'm concerned. So, well, I've, um, I've never heard a sponsor or a, a financier of a media network to influence the content of the periodical or broadcast. Yeah, this this is it's unacceptable. It's unscientific, and uh, it's it does disservice to those journals. So I I resign from those two. Anyway, um, okay. so to get it published is quite a thing, but it's it's important that other people be able to produce similar results. And so, you know, here's just a few of the people. I mean, uh, Dr. Zelenko, uh, who was one of the people who uh, made uh, President Trump aware of hydroxychloroquine. He's reporting an 84 percent reduction in hospitalizations back there in those numbers that I was showing as outpatients. Uh, uh, Dr. McCullough and a variety of other people accumulated nine different studies looking at hydroxychloroquine and other uh, studies uh, and showed a 60% reduction in death. Uh, the uh, Association of American Physicians and Surgeons have shown similar results on their websites. Dr. Reich from Yale University uh, showed hydroxychloroquine produced a 30%, 34% reduction in the risk of death. So you can flip that around with Sixty-six uh, percent improvement. Um, uh, you know, and 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 kudos to the Yale uh, School of Medicine dean, Dr. Verman, for responding to criticisms when they were going after Dr. Rich by stating that you know it's not the function of a dean to criticize physicians who are doing research and and investigating to try and find answers. Find answers. I mean, if you have a problem, then you need to submit your letters to the editor or other mechanisms to to give your alternative viewpoints. But you don't, you know, there's this big thing out there right now for all people trying to retract papers based upon the fact that they don't like what's published in the papers as opposed to whether it's scientifically invalid. And that is not, that doesn't do the scientific or medical uh, community any good. In fact, there's a huge benefit to having papers that show no benefit in published research because part of the job of a, of a researcher, of a scientist, is to go see what's been published in a field. And if you can find papers that show that something doesn't work, that's as important as finding that something does work because it guides you to your research. Um, back to that site. Please. Is, is that not because of the fourth law of thermodynamics? <laughs> the fourth one? <laughs> the fourth law, yeah. Thou shall not lose thy funding. Yeah. <laughs> well, the physicist was only aware of the first three. Um, yeah, do not lose thy funding. Uh, Dr. Bartlett, um, again, he was talking about uh, nasal steroids being 100% successful. And then Dr. Italia, uh, uh, looking at, at the impact uh, and long-term care facilities and the benefit of anticoagulants uh, producing an 84% reduction of people less likely to die. So... The more you look at the literature from people that are trying to independently find answers for this, the more you see these consistencies. And, and, and you know, unless you are going to say that everybody is now talking with everybody and saying, well, what are you getting for numbers so I can write something similar? Uh, and I'm sure that there are probably people out there who would who would entertain that as, as a justification for them not agreeing with the results. Then you have to ask the question, why are these numbers coming up so consistent across the board from people who don't know each other? And, and you know, some of us are now obviously beginning to learn about each other and, and, and raise questions. But... Um, 
consistency of results from one place to another is the hallmark of valid scientific data. Next slide, please. This is, uh, so this is a diagram that we have on FlemingMethod.com. Uh, it's already out, out of date um, because it addresses uh, the difference between a respiratory viral uh, pathogen requiring uh, an ACE2 receptor, as you can see in the center there, getting into the cells and then uh, undergoing uh, replication and uh, inflammothrombotic responses to looking at the Pfizer Moderna uh, lipid nanoparticles, number two. And if you do the mathematics of it based upon the weight, uh, those vaccines contain about 13 billion mRNAs that merge with the cell receptors. So gain of function is actually uh, alteration of the virus to uh, increase its infectivity and pathogenicity. So the PRRA insert is one mode. The HIV glycoprotein is another the uh, the uh, prion-like domain has become another, and the lipid nanoparticle and the vaccines are actually a another form of uh, uh, enhanced gain of function because they no longer are dependent upon ACE receptors to enter the cell. They either merge as a as a uh, as a lipid nanoparticle, which we know travel around the body, uh, infecting all parts of the body: the brain, the the liver, the lungs, the heart, the the bone marrow. Uh, thanks to Moderna's study with influenza lipid nanoparticle vaccines. Um, we know that those spike proteins get into the brain and produce those prion-like diseases and uh, do so through neuropillin-1 and uh, also interfere with the recognition of the level of hypoxia or just how poor uh, somebody's oxygen level is uh, as, as a result of this infection. And then uh, Johnson & Johnson, which you don't see the adenovirus added on here, uh, but it is a virus that, you know, used to be considered deadly that they came up with vaccines for. Uh, the adenovirus is grown on uh, retinal uh, tissue from, uh, uh, it was uh, originally an 18-month-old aborted fetus uh, retinal tissue, but it's uh, the adenovirus is grown on that. And then supposedly, if we believe uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, is unable to replicate itself, but has been inserted with double-stranded DNA. So again, they've gone beyond altering the spike protein to now providing the genetic sequences mRNA for the spike protein to now replacing the uracils on the mRNA inserting thymidine to make DNA, a single strand, and then complementing it with the additional one to put inside the adenovirus so it can infect cells and go straight to the nucleus where it will uh, will then start the process going back out. So we know that the uh, Pfizer and Pfizer uh, vaccine actually inserts itself into the human DNA. And if we go back to that slide, you can see that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, the mRNA has been shown to insert itself into the uh, DNA. In that bottom right corner, you'll see uh, what looks like uh, uh, red uh, haloing a blue area. That blue area is uh, DNA of a human cell, and the mRNA uh, is colored in red, and you can see that red dot inside showing that the mRNA of the uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus has actually entered the nucleus. So, um, now that's a very detailed diagram that's available from your website. I understand. Correct. Correct. And, and, and your website is FlemingMethod.com. Okay. And so that's that's a very important thing uh, because you know what makes uh, HIV so uh, unique is that it has this reverse transcriptase ability. So when DNA gets turned into mRNA, that's called transcription. And when you take RNA and send it back into DNA, that's called reverse transcription. And the enzymes that do that are called reverse transcriptase. So we used to think that um, HIV was, was really the first one to teach us this ability. We now know that, um, thanks to the Human Genome Project, that the long interspersed nuclear elements of human DNA, about 17% of our DNA has this reverse transcriptase capability. Uh, in cardiology, we've known for some time that platelets that are involved in blood clotting uh, have this reverse transcriptase capability. So if you give it the right viral or, or genetic material, it will reverse transcribe it. 
We also know that CD4 helper cells have this capability, which is how HIV infected uh, CD4 helper cells and would lay dormant for a while and then re-expose itself. And part of what we're seeing with the people with uh, SARS-CoV-2 is about one in um, uh, one in three patients are coming back in about five months with about one in eight of those patients dying. And so they will get better, they will get over it. But because they're actually not being treated for either the infection, the attachment, or the replication, and they're not being treated for the inflammatory response, what's happened is that the virus goes dormant and then re-expresses itself. So sometimes when uh, the media has been talking about uh, somebody gets a second infection, the question really uh, becomes more of, did they get another infection with somebody else, or is this simply the dormant virus now re-expressing itself? And, and viruses do this over and over again if they're not properly treated. Um, herpes zoster or shingles that most people uh, are aware of is nothing more than a re-expression of uh, the varicella uh, virus or the, or the chickenpox virus. So you get chickenpox, usually when you're younger, um, uh, your body deals with it, and then uh, the virus lays dormant in what's called the dorsal root ganglia, which, or, or neurologic uh, connections between the central and peripheral nervous system that, that run both sides of your spinal column, and, and they lay dormant there. And then when you're immune suppressed for some reason, you're, you're, you're ill, you get diabetes, you're getting chemotherapy, a variety of things, then the virus can re-express itself and it comes back along the nerve roots. And that's why you see it line up on the skin on patterns because it runs, runs along the sensory uh, network of that, of that uh, peripheral nerve and it re-expresses itself and then you know you treat it and it goes back into a dormant state so this is not a new phenomenon and and the problem is is that you have to treat it and so we're going to see I, I long-term sequelae long after this but the problem the problem with all this is that people are not getting the types of treatments they should be getting the vaccines themselves do not prevent you from getting an infection they do not prevent you from spreading an infection they prime your immune system in the same way that getting the infection naturally would do, except it's overwhelming your immune system so that what we're seeing is that normally the people who had problems were the people in those two extremes, the immune naive or the hyperthrombotic ones. Those are the people that were presenting with the disease and the symptoms. Now what we're seeing are individuals in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s having the symptoms and you're seeing an overwhelmed immune system now receiving billions of messenger RNA or DNA to make spike protein, and, and they're responding appropriately. So <clears throat> all of this, SARS-CoV-2, raises a number of serious moral, ethical, and scientific concerns. Um, there, there's no way around this. Um, this gain-of-function research and the release of SARS-CoV-2, it, it no longer matters whether the release was intentional or accidental. Um, they're culpable. They're criminally culpable. Um, the interference with physicians treating patients so that we can stop people from dying, so that we can minimize the long-term sequelae uh, by getting the infection and the inflammatory thrombotic response under control. The, I mean, I'm dumbfounded by the vaccines. Uh, you know, I, uh, I guess I may be the only one who remembers swine flu vaccines. I took care of I was an orderly. I took care of Guillain-Barre, this neurologic abnormalities in the hospital before going to medical school uh, for people who had the swine flu vaccine. That was the last great rushed vaccine that I'm aware of um, with a neurologic sequelae. Um, it's just, it's, it's unconscionable. Um, this is experimental. Uh, the fact that, and there's not, physicians are not standing there at the testing sites for swabbing for PCR. Physicians are not standing there at the vaccine sites. Informed consent is not happening. You know, Nazi Germany didn't do this to people across the board. They didn't experiment on their entire population. This is an experiment on the entire populace of the United States, of the UK, of every country who is going along with this and promoting this. And, you know, the the there's a cute joke that I heard, you know, a little bit of brevity. Two, two, two rats are looking at each other, and the one rat says, are you going to get the vaccine? And the second rat looks at the first one and says, they haven't finished the human trials yet. 
Ooh. Okay. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> My God. <laughs> a bit of a joke. <laughs> yeah, we need some of this. Okay, we're now going on Go. to the next slide, and uh, um, we'll be I... running for by two hours. So oh, sorry real... about that. Okay, no, that's perfect. That's fine. Let's go back to that last slide briefly because there was a fourth thing I think that I had there. Okay. I'll just... Oh, and 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 we hit it. Vaccination treatment without informed consent. Okay, let's we can go to the next slide. Informed consent. It just it's 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 a requirement. Uh, we we would we would I mean it is unconscionable that you would not have people signed informed consent. I don't know where the lawyers are on this one, but guys, well, they've been bought off, haven't they? I I don't know. Uh, is is somebody needs to step forward um, and and insist upon this? Um, you know, the legal system is always all over doctors about informed consent and and uh, and anything else that uh, they can be taken to task with. And, the, you know, if you're a good attorney and you're really worried about the people, uh, please get out there and start making sure that people are taken care of. Back to the Department of Defense, National Institutes of Allergies, Infectious Diseases, NIH, every one of these government agencies, this is a biological weapon. This is a, bi uh, this is a violation of the Biological Weapons Convention Treaty. If... if any nation, if, if the United States knew that any other nation was responsible for launching a biological weapon, we would have them in international court in record time. There's, there's no peaceful or prophylactic purpose behind this under all circumstances. Biological. So the final declaration document concluded that under all circumstances, the use of biological and toxic weapons is effectively prohibited by the convention and affirms the determination of states parties to condemn any use of biological agents or weapons or toxins other than for peaceful purposes by anyone at any time. And I'm pretty certain that includes all of the people that we've already talked about. Next slide, please. It is a violation of the 1947 Nuremberg Code, where, where you know, after Nazi Germany, you, we sat down and we said, you cannot experiment on human beings. There is a right way and a wrong way to conduct medical and scientific research. One, one provision, number three, is based upon the results of animal experimentation. You know, this the, that that was just completely, almost completely circumvented. I'm I'm only aware of a few studies, and and those are studies by people that were trying to investigate on their own, not by the powers that be trying to do a thorough job to determine the the consequences, and and, and the harm and the benefit that might occur for treatments and vaccines. Next slide, please. It's a violation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Article 7 says that, in particular, no one shall be subjected without his free consent to medical or scientific experimentation. Eleanor Roosevelt pushed to get the ICCPR Treaty signed, of which the United States is a signatory and ratifier of, which was, which was pushed into the UN after Nazi Germany to make sure that experiments that were done like peop by people like Mengele were never done again in human history. Next slide, please. And it is a violation, a clear violation of the Code of Ethics of the Medi American Medical Association. Informed consent requires a patient and a physician and it requires that patients be made aware of the reason why they're undergoing testing or treatment, the risks and the benefits of that. Not doing that is a violation of the AMA Code of Method Medical Ethics. Next slide, please. So what I'm calling for are four basic fundamental things. One, the immediate cessation of any gain of function research. Any gain of function research that may be applicable or useful in the future requires physicians and scientists to determine what the limitations and controls of that research must be. What has been demonstrated is that the US has funded and, and apparently the UK has funded and I've heard Israel has funded and China has been a part of gain of function research done that has placed at risk the entire planet 
by a pandemic with the consequences that we've all lived with for more than a year. This gain of function research must cease if effective immediately. Two, that physicians be allowed to practice medicine and provide to their patients treatments that work, either based upon published data like my work or, or, or preprint work from the people that, that I mentioned in earlier slides, as long as informed consent is provided. Patients and physicians decide that treatment, not governments, not government officials, not courts, not bureaucrats, physicians and patients. Number three, the immediate cessation of experimental vaccines, and that's what these are. The vaccines are being judged based upon whether they, they change PCR levels or whether someone gets the disease. The evaluation of these vaccines should be whether they produce T cell and antibody responses to shorten the duration. There's no data being published on T cell or antibody responses, no antibody titers, no mention of IgA, and not much T cell information being provided. The immediate cessation of these vaccines until it can be proven whether they're safe and effective. And by the way, emergency use authorization, the fourth requirement for EUAs to exist is that there is no proven medical treatment effective for the disease. Raising the serious question as to why so much effort has been placed to block treatments from being received by patients for doctors and patients who want to try those treatments. It's, it, it is, not, not to beat a dead horse here, unconscionable that any government agency would put such an effort to block treatments and push for vaccines, which are not treatments. There are more than 500,000 dead Americans as a result of SARS-CoV-2. Put into perspective, it's more people than died in all the military people who died in World War One, or I'm sorry, World War Two more than all the soldiers who died in America's bloodiest war, the Civil War, and more than all these American soldiers that died in all of our other wars together. <clears throat> this is a biological weapon. The ramifications in death toll are shown against these military campaigns. It dwarfs what's gone on in any other of the two major wars that we had and all the other wars combined. Next slide, please. Because of that, I'm also calling for the immediate investigation and prosecution of those individuals involved in the gain of function research and the release of this virus. Their intentional knowing and reckless actions meet the definition of crimes against humanity, and they should be held accountable in international, national, and state tribunals for crimes against humanity. Nothing less will stop them from continuing the behaviors that they've already demonstrated that they're not only able to do, willing to do, but continuing to do. Next slide, please. This is what SARS-CoV-2 looks like, and if and I will I will send you the video so you can show it. Of the, of the side on the right shows it goes up and down, and you can see the actual sars corona cov 2 virus uh, with its spike proteins in its corona shape. I'll send that to you so you can play that. It's in, it's incredibly important because there are people out there that are actually of the opinion that SARS-CoV-2 doesn't exist and has not been isolated. These individuals not only have demonstrated they don't understand viruses, but they interfere with the, with the serious discussion going on with this virus. Because as long as there are people that believe that the virus doesn't exist, then the powers that be that have actually gain a functioned this virus can shoot down anybody else coming up with credible concerns because it places the people with serious concerns on the opposite side of the, of the debate. And when part of the people on the opposite side of the debate are people that don't even understand that, that Dr. Fleming, uh, we've lost you again, but uh, if you can hear me, we're just going to, that was a major statement yeah. you were saying there. And yeah. just while we pick up the data rate, 
Uh, apologies for a couple of notifications right. coming in there. I can't stop. But uh, yeah. I had a very important that we've been blocked here. Um, who who is they? Um, they 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 are the people like uh, Dr. Andrew Kaufman and 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 Cowan and and people like that who believe that germ theory doesn't exist and that terrain theory it, theory is 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 the thing. Well, terrain theory was destroyed a long time ago. The, you know, it's nice to use the term terrain, the lay of the land, because the immune response is part of the terrain. But just because you use that term doesn't mean that you're using it correctly. They would like to believe that exosomes uh, are, are the actual virus. But these same types of people, when, when SARS-CoV-2, when COVID-19 was discussed, they, they thought that COVID-19 was the 19th coronavirus. They thought that the spike protein was actually the virus itself. They don't understand virology. Um, so the people that are, that are promulgating uh, the idea that viruses don't exist interfere with the serious discussion trying to deal with people that have actually gained a function to this virus which has produced this pandemic. Um, so it's very important that people understand that viruses are real. They've been cultured. That's how we know that they're mutating. We, we can see the change in the genetic code. And the important thing here is that viruses naturally do not get more virulent as they, as they mutate and change because a virus needs living hosts to survive. So if the virus becomes more virulent, more nasty, more pathogenetic, and kills the host, then the virus dies. And it won't be passed on. So when you look at something that's happening right now, we're seeing an increased virulence or nastiness, pathogenicity to this virus. And you have to ask yourself where it's coming from. And, and it's not occurring naturally any more than the original spike protein did. So given the fact that they haven't been honest with this, given the fact that if you look at when these virulence uh, variants uh, occur, they're occurring after vaccinations are beginning in those areas. It raises a serious question about whether these, these variants that we're seeing that are nastier are actually part of the vaccines that are being used around the world. Is this the source of, of, of these variants? Because this would be the first time in history where a virus is getting more infective and more pathogenetic, which would be its undoing if, if it did that. If it kills the host, it's dead. It won't continue to transmit itself. One of the crucial things I wanted to ask was, do you think what you've just spoken about is controlled opposition? I, you know, I try not to get into um, anything non-scientific. I, I, I think the importance of my position is to say as the scientist physician and to provide that. What I find challenging is the response of the medical journals to all the research papers that are presenting treatment information that goes counter to the narrative being promulgated by, for lack of a better term, the system, the establishment. Um, that raises serious questions for me. I, what I saw last year in, in the United States was a polarization of people. Um, and I'm sure this is what was going on around the world, that people really divided themselves up into, in, into two separate camps. Those who um, claimed that they were following the science and those who were concerned about the loss of social freedoms. And I really think that those two need to mesh together. Um, the people that are wearing masks and, 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 and worried about people who aren't wearing masks are doing so, I think, because they have been scared to the place where they, are, they literally believe that their lives and the lives of the people they care about are at risk if they don't wear the masks. And understanding that is important because rather than having a conversation with people and saying, well, that's just silly or wrong for whatever reason, if you can empathize and understand why another person is thinking about this the way they are, 
it's it's easier to come to terms. It's easier to have an intelligent, informed discussion. And as long as we have two essentially polarized groups, um, we're not having these discussions. It is, and it's and it's interfered with people understanding that there are treatments for this. It's interfered with people understanding that this virus is gain of function produced. It, it's interfered because a lot of people want to trust, for lack of a better term, the establishment. So I was born in 1956. So I was raised during the Vietnam era and all the stuff that went on with that and all the terms, the establishment system. So I try not to overuse those terms. But when you see the 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 central theme pushing something and pushing so hard and pushing back against anybody else who presents an idea like treatments or other approaches. Th that raises red flags in my mind as a scientist, because in science, one of the, one of the fundamental things is that if something is not understood, then there has to be something wrong with the fundamental approach or theorem you know it's 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 like cholesterol or the or the redistribution of these isotopes it's not until you step back and go well wait a minute maybe we're missing something and what what does somebody else have to say on this that you start to understand things as being different you can't get to that level of understanding if your attitude is you you are you are wrong there are no treatments hydroxychloroquine cannot work because it because it cannot work um, and when you're a scientist, like Dr. Fauci, and, and you say hydroxychloroquine works for SARS-CoV-1, but then SARS-CoV-2 comes across and you go, no, 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 it, it doesn't work. You have to wonder what's going on scientifically and objectively. So <clears throat> for a lot of people, I think they're following misinformation and, and I can't speak to the motives of the people that are providing that misinformation. All I can do is say it's misinformation because the research data shows these treatments do work. The research data has not provided T cell or antibody responses to the vaccine. The research data has not shown that the vaccines prevent you from getting the virus or spreading the virus. Um, the paper trail shows that this virus uh, has is is man-made uh, with gain of function research and paid for heavily by U.S. tax dollars. Um, the science doesn't lie if you're if you're objective and you're willing to look at it. And and what happens is that whenever people get into a position that they're unwilling to look at what somebody else is saying, um, they pose a threat to themselves of not understanding the truth. I've I've always told people, if you can come up to me on anything that I've published, my theory, whatever, and come up with a credible argument for why there's something wrong or maybe should be changed, I, I will change my mind if it's credible. That doesn't mean you get to come up to me with something that isn't credible and, and go, well, you said if I came up to you with something, uh, you'd accept it. No, it has to be credible. It has to be intelligent. But, you know, that's how we make scientific advances. I mean, Semmelweis told people that you need to ha wash your hands to decrease infant mortality. Hubble told people that the universe was expanding. Einstein explained uh, the effects of gravity in both special and general relativity theory. Um, Fleming described the inflammatory process uh, and, and the role of viruses and bacteria. Uh, many, many people have been treating SARS-CoV-2 successfully with a variety of drugs, some of which I haven't looked at, ivermectin, for example. And I can't say that I can, I, I can say that ivermectin works, but what I can say is they certainly believe it does and they are providing scientific data to support it. So you have to look at that credibly. Um, hopefully that answered that question. <laughs> Well, we have an awful lot of uh, books and things uh, drawing to a close here that uh, you've got uh, more information from more medical, from both medical professionals. Yeah, there's there's a ton of things on on Amazon.com uh, that includes things about the viruses, includes things about uh, nuclear uh, imaging and echocardiography and pacemakers and electrocardiograms and uh, vaccines. You can see Operation Warp Speed. Uh, Mirror Mirror talks about some of the wonderful experiences I've had in my life with Big Pharma and the courts and um, just some generally uh, good information for people. And then uh, 
some of the prior books on how to bypass your bypass and the diet myth and stop inflammation now. The Heart Healthy program was over in the UK. That's the equivalent of Stop Inflammation Now, but those are all available on Amazon.com. And, and hopefully we'll give more information and insight for people um, so they can kind of sit down and, 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 and go over it. One of the benefits of the books is that Sometimes you read something and, and you're not quite certain, but if you read through it several times, you it, it starts to make more and more sense. That's that's the benefit of a book. And the other thing is that even if you don't completely understand it, uh, knowing that there's a real science behind it can go a long way for you to go, well, it's not just an opinion. It's not just uh, somebody's idea. There's science behind it. And one of the big things that... that I'm in favor of is is science and you know it's it's a challenge right now because I realize that SARS-CoV-2 uh, was probably the least thing that that the general public was prepared to take on which was a virus um, and and really what that is uh, it's it's not the simplest of uh, biological uh, things to understand I mean it's for the general public, um, you know, but it's a very intelligently uh, organized system that uh, doesn't waste its energy uh, having the reproductive uh, machinery within itself. It uses a host to do that. And because of that, that gives us ways to actually target and treat it, which we can and should be doing. Well, uh, sir, uh, those books, of course, can be obtained from Devices Books here in Devices, who have a wonderful bookshop. Uh, Handel Bookshop's a beautiful, a beautiful place. is about 400 years old, and they can get any book you need. But that's not a sponsorship. It's just a mention. But finally, um, uh, we have yourself, sir, and uh, how people can actually uh, get hold of you and um, extra stuff. <clears throat> extra stuff. Um, certainly, uh, FlemingMethod.com, uh, you can see on the website there. Hopefully, we'll answer a lot of questions um, for people. Uh, YouTube videos, we, we've done quite a few of them. Not, not in my wildest imagination did I think I was going to do so many YouTube videos. But, you know, yeah. Are they staying up? Um, there, there's mean, a couple are they, that... There's a few being taken down. There's, we don't know if this will stay up. We don't even know if this will get up in the first place on YouTube, but we'll see. <laughs> Well, we'll, cer we'll certainly find find out. I mean, certainly the the I guess the the term that I use for them are trolls um, uh, out there that that just hate it when something gets out that that goes against what they personally believe. Um, you know, one of the things that when people behave that way that that always uh, sticks in the back of my mind is that when when you're so adamant that somebody else uh, is wrong, you know, on, on treatments or, or testing or whatever, you have to ask yourself a fundamental question. What happens to you if you become sick or someone you care about suddenly becomes sick and ill? And then I think it changes the, the perspective considerably. So there, there are all sorts of people out there that certainly have demonstrated that they have a perspective that they want to uh, want to continue to perpetuate. Um but no matter how much power and, and prestige that gives them, in the end, should they should they have a problem, should they become ill with it, should they become hospitalized, uh, they have a serious concern and question to raise, which is if the thing that they attack is the very thing that helps them or the person that they love, um, they've done a tremendous disservice to themselves and to other people in the meantime. Well, sir, uh, as we we um, we say with these things, it's uh, good night from me, which is daylight, and um, I suppose it's good night from you, sir. Well, Miles, it's been my pleasure. I'm, I, thank you for the invitation. Um, I look forward to uh, getting this information shared with people, and uh, hopefully, we can help clarify a lot of the misinformation that's out there and help some people. That's the real benefit of this. Thank you so much. And I will put this on DVD and Blu-ray for the resolution. Uh, those are things called spinning discs you put in some kind of machine. <laughs> and really, th thank you so much. It's a tremendous honor and pleasure. And hopefully this will get out there and we will get this out there one way or another. Uh, uh, but uh, we'll leave those dark forces to let the shadows fall, as they say. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a good two and a half hours. I'm very honored, and thank you. Thank you.